Well, hi everyone, and welcome to our second webinar on digital financial services, which today will focus on implementation case studies and lessons learned. This is the last webinar for this year, and we wanted to thank you all who have attended our previous webinars throughout 2017, and we look forward to having you in our upcoming webinars in 2018. I want to introduce to you to CapPlus Digital Financial Service Expert, Mr. Andrew Lake, who will be our speaker for the webinar today. Mr. Lake has over 19 years of experience in digital financial services. Prior to joining CapPlus, he was a Global Digital Financial Service Specialist with the IFC Financial Institution Advisory Services. He has guided many banks, NBFIs and microfinance institution, as well as fintech companies in the development, improvement and implementation of their digital strategies in Eastern Europe, Latin America, Africa, Middle East and also Asia. Prior to joining the IFC, Andrew also started and managed two full commercial mobile banking operations, one in South Africa and another one in Bahrain. Andrew has been taken the organization from the concept to the end of the first year of trading. So uh, I'll leave the floor to Andrew. Andrew? Thank you, Alkis. Um, and thank you to, to everybody who's in the audience uh, who's taken the time out to uh, attend this session. Uh, as Alkis mentioned, this is the follow-up to a previous uh, discussion we had about a month ago um, where we dealt with the concept of, of DFS strategy and why it is that a bank would would consider DFS as a as an as an option. Um, in today's session, we will quickly re recap on the strategy types and implement some implementation considerations. Then we will deal with examples of the strategy types that that we I work, worked on and with um, in some countries, just to highlight some of the issues. Um, We'll deal with an example where it all literally went very wrong, um, just so that because there are a lot of learnings rolled rolled up in that project, and then we can we'll draw some some lessons learned, and then it's open to the group for Q and A. Uh, Alkis didn't mention in the in the launch, but feel free to pass your quest questions to Alkis anytime you like. She will decide whether to interrupt me or not, um, and. Um, We'll either deal with your questions at the in the Q and A session or in real time, based on whether Alkis decides to 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 interrupt me. All right. Um, why DFS is important? I just want to recap quickly. DFS is is important to financial services companies. In my impression, or our impression, simply because the market has moved. Um, that little pink cake on the left there with the Pac-Man lining up to eat it is the is banking business. The major competitors that are looking at the moment and are in fact making big inroads particularly in africa and in some parts of, of asia are the telcos and the retailers but behind them are a plethora of startups and um and fintechs and behind them come the behemoths the, the googles the amazons of the world who are going to enter or have already entered financial services um and are going to make major plays so basically the competition is lined up in in the market on the one side on the other side the market, the, the, the clients have moved. The millennials are now uh, significant players in the market uh, and it's going to, and are going to become more and more significant over time. And um, if you're not on a millennial's phone, you don't really exist. Um, so the, the point about digital is that you need to be there for the, for the new market to see you. Um, and the, there are other people who will do it. So, guys, it's a, it's a, in, in, in our opinion, it's important that you consider your options in this regard. The strategic options that digital presents you basically are presented on this grid. It's There are four directions that a bank could choose to go. One is to expand itself. By that, I mean new markets, new customers, grow your business. Um, digital has done some pretty astounding things for some organizations. I've got an example for you later um, in, terms of, in terms of growth. You can enter new target markets, you can enter geography that you currently can't reach with your existing distribution, or you can do it under secondary brands allowing you to effectively have completely com conflicting pricing plans or pricing options and service offerings because you can present yourself to the market as two different organizations. Cost containment is Digital is one of the cheapest ways to to, to deliver a, to deliver retail banking. 
Um, at, well, while we're, I was at the IFC, we did a lot of research into it. If you get everything right, you can achieve an 80% discount on cost to serve relative to br entirely branch driven or entirely loan officer driven uh, financial services. So those costs and that, that level of cost containment um, will enable you to either cut your retail price towards your customers or take it to the bottom line or use that money for uh, expansion and diversification of your business. Uh, the other option is, that is available to you is customer service being right digitally delivered right to your customer where the customer needs you, when the customer needs you is of great value to your business. Um, and finally, defensive, the ability out there in the market, all those little pack men from the previous slide are out there and some financial institutions have adopted a purely defensive strategy, um, which I'll unpack for you in more detail in a few moments. One of the questions I was asked towards the end of the previous uh, webinar is what does it take if, if we're a, if we're just if we're an MFI with nothing digital, what's involved in getting from where we are to to digital? What I've, what I've drawn here, when, when, of course, the, 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 the pure consultant answer is how long is a piece of string, but the easiest way to, to do this is to assume that there is absolutely nothing. If, if the organization has nothing, no computer system, no existing distribution beyond their own branches, what's involved? We, the projects that we, that we run basically run in four phases. First one is feasibility. Does the business make sense? Can we get this? this financial services entity into the digital market in a meaningful way that services the customer base profitably so that it's, it is sustainable into the future. Well, what we do during that phase is target market selection, needs analysis, strategy design, product design, financial analysis of the total offering to ensure that it is f financially feasible and there will be payback on the project. And then it goes through the normal uh, corporate governance phases. The construction phase, which follows a yes in the corporate governance phase, uh, effectively is where all the computer systems are bought, where the real money is committed. Uh, the systems are bought, the uh, processes are designed, the, the staff training, the, the usual construction phase of a business that's going to trade, because digital is not, a, is not about computer systems, it is a complete business. Um, and you'll see there's, yeah, although the first one is get the systems, everything else is about actually creating an operational company. After that comes the pilot phase, which we normally recommend is three to six months long, during which we prove that, first of all, the business hypothesis that the, that the, that the market needs we identified do indeed exist. So we test, that as, we test that as well as that all the processes and computer systems and everything are working properly. And then operational phase. In terms of money commitment, getting through feasibility is approximately $300,000 by the time you've done it. Um, construction phase runs somewhere between one and a half to two and a half million dollars, depending on what you buy and what and what you roll out for your pilot. And most of these businesses, all businesses that go into a launch phase, of course, face a hockey stick. And the bottom of the, by the time they reach the bottom of the hockey stick, most of them have spent somewhere between, five, a cumulative somewhere to f between five and $10 million. The ones that are edging towards the $10 million mark are generally in a bit of trouble. So if you go part, if you sell past the, the five million dollar mark and you're still going down, there's probably a problem inside your business. The, what I'm putting in front of you here are very generic numbers. I do want to caveat this whole slide by saying to you, I have worked with one organisation that literally spent seven, several, not seven, several hundred million dollars getting into digital. They did a completely different level to what I'm talking about now. They entered a very sophisticated banking market at a, at, and that is very aggressively traded. And they took themselves basically into the top 15 banks of a very large market in 24 months. So the digital, although the investment was substantial, the payback was substantial too. But so the, these five to 10 million is, is, is for a sort of a servicing the unbanked level entry. This other one was a full on attack in the bank market of a very sophisticated country. Um, in terms of timing from concept to launch your business, you're looking at something like 13 to 21 months, depending what exists. And from market entry 
to break even on your business, i.e. to reach the, the point of peak funding of around five to 10 million, is typically somewhere between 36 and 48 months. So this is the structure, this is what it looks like if you decide to go into digital and embark upon this, this, this route. So, in terms of question, one of the things, uh, sorry, one of the things I, I dealt with in the previous uh, presentation, which I didn't cut, cut, and, cut and paste into this one, is for a digital business to break even on a month-to-month -month basis, you need to have about 150,000 active clients on your base in a given 30-day period, um, which means that you need to sign up about half a million customers to make to reach the break-even point where we uh, where we peak peak the funding at somewhere between five and ten million, you have to um, have about half a million customers on your base. So the question is that that we'd like to put to you is: Can your organisation reach sufficient customers to actually carry DFS? And some and yeah, the question: If you could answer the the questions and choose from the options, would be great. Thank you, Andrew. We'll keep the polls for another 30 seconds as we receive um, the answers. Perfect. And then we'll share with you the results of this poll. So can your organization reach enough customers to carry DFS? Um, I think we need to close the polls now. And then, so we got some mixed results, as you see, Andrew. I'll leave it up to you. Uh, the majority, a good 35%, says not without partnering. And then we have 22% not without syndicating with other banks or MFIs, and yes. So I'll leave it up to you if you want to discuss more on this. Okay, the, the, the yes is... Are, are great. That that means these these are fairly substantial institutions with 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 significant market reach. It doesn't surprise me at all that the answer comes back that you need to partner or syndicate. Um, sp specifically, MFIs. I'm not exactly sure the composition of the of the audience, of course, but with with specifically MFIs and smaller banks to reach this these kinds of numbers is sometimes difficult. And it is something that we that we strongly advise, in fact, is partnering with somebody who has a large customer base, be that a retailer or a telco or somebody, or alternatively syndicating with people who are currently your opposition to share that financial risk that I spoke about before so that it is ameliorated across a greater customer base and therefore your probability of success as, as individual organizations rise. Um, of course, if you're syndicating with your opposition, then you need very carefully contrived rules in terms of who competes with what and who can see which information, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But it is doable and it has been done before. Right. Getting ourselves, our business growing up the, the kinds of hockey stick that I'm, I referred to, to achieve the five to ten million dollar um, peak funding, one has, it is critical to success that, that we get economies of scale. We need to get those 500,000 customers on board. We need them to be motivated to work with us and, the, and to work with us every month or as many, as, as many of them every month as possible. And that means that we need to key into what the customers really, really need. We can't put out a generic digital offering which is just funky or just cool. It needs to have an actual, solve an actual business need. To do that, what we do at Cap Plus is we go and we help the clients to choose a target market segment, which is the, the, the first 12 o'clock to one o'clock segment. Um, once we've done that, we understand the actual financial needs of that segment, i.e. What, what is a problem that we can solve for that market so that they actually need our product? We design a product prototype. We design a product distribution structure which fits First of all, with the target market, so it's, ge it's geographically where the market is, and secondly, is tailored to the product. We then run market research. The reason that we do that is we do it for primary market research so that we understand fully what the market 
what likes about the product, what they don't like about the product, so that we can accurately pre predict how many people will take it up and what they will use it for and whether, whether the numbers will make sense. We then produce a, a financial model, a 60-month financial model, to prove the situation regarding the, the overall project financing and whether the project will pay back. On many of the projects that I've worked on, we reach the oh dear moment where the segment actually cannot carry the capital. And so we have to go and find a few more segments and do this again so that we end up with sufficient revenue in the business so that the business itself is commercially feasible once built. But, but if we do that, sorry, if we do that so properly, um, we will find ourselves in a position where we have a profitable business going forward. Segmentation can be done in, in a myriad of ways, um, one of which is to, use, is to use education as a segmentation basis. Um, the, what, what I've put up here is, is, is if we took, many of you will, uh, uh, will be working on a low-cost school strategy. So the question is, would a low-cost school actually provide a lens for, for customer segmentation? And we believe yes. Um, we believe that the low-cost school could be viewed in one of three roles, or in fact, all of three roles even. Um, you can view the school itself, the SME, as a client. You can view the school in the bottom right corner there as an, a consumer aggregator when we sell to it to the to the children's parents and, and, and family. Or you can regard the school as a payroll provider and sell to the staff of the school. In this particular slide, we're looking at the school itself as a client. And if we look at if we were to talk about this hypothetical these hypothetical schools. We'd be looking at an entity that needs cash management, possibly to receive electronic payments so that they can take cash out of their business because I gather many low-cost schools currently receive cash and hold that cash, which presents problems to banks because you, can't, you cannot see their cash flows. Um, so if we gave them the ability to receive electronic payments um, and on a, on a cost-effective basis, we would then be in a, in a position to track their cash flows and therefore be in a position to lend to them. The product that would suit a school would probably be a full transactional account, the ability to receive electronic payments from the parents, and real-time credit scoring, which would allow the bank to track the school in, in, in the background, effectively to, uh, to work out what they would be willing to lend to the bank, and that, to the school at least, and at what price. Um, the advantages to the FIO is this will give you access to a potentially lucrative and consistent SME base. Um, I believe that a school would, be, would tend to be credit worthy because they, they have a reputation to maintain in the market. Um, you also have visibility of the cash flow, which you currently don't get, um, which enables you to more, more accurately manage the client as a debtor. Challenges, it's a relatively small market, um, so I'm unconvinced that you will get enough revenue out of just banking the schools themselves to drive a digital, a digital strategy. Could you service it off an existing digital operation yes could you could you do this in conjunction with using the skill the school as an aggregator of your of clients i believe that there's definitely hope definitely scope there um if we if we start aiming for the parents of the school children as an aggregated consumer segment again the the needs of that segment would typically be electronic payments possibly remittances depending upon the country um cash in cash out ability uh, close to home uh, sa and savings and cost effective credit so the products we would roll would probably be something like a full transaction account linked to some electronic means savings facility and credit to cover things like school fees or uniforms as an added bonus we could consider appointing the school itself as an agent to actually service the, 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 the parents. That means parents could deposit money into their accounts or withdraw money from their accounts and or open accounts and manage their relationship with the bank at the school while picking up and dropping off the children. It's, an it's, it, it's also a revenue opportunity for the school. So I think there's, a, there's good synergy in terms of as, with this as a strategy. Um, as an FI, this will give you access to a very, relatively large bank base. Um, of customers with relatively homogenous needs because we're talking about people in the same life stage with children at a specific age. Um, your social and, and group dynamics are likely to be similar to an MFI. Nobody would want to be seen to renege on a loan that is from the school, especially if you adopt uh, brand, the school's branding as part of your agency strategy. Somehow tie the, the school brand to the, to the bank, to the financial services brand 
as part of the agency outsource. Challenge, I haven't actually seen this done in the market, but I definitely think it's something that would be nice to, uh, to work with uh, in the FI in this, in this field. The last one is the school is an employer. Um, they have teachers, um, so therefore salary, electronic salary payments would be important. I've got a case study later on about uh, just how hard it is for some teachers to get paid. Um, electronic payments, the teachers are effectively consumers, so they need electronic receipt of electronic payments, they need to make payments, and they need savings and, and loans the same as any other consumer. So again, we'd propose a, a full transactional account, the ability to receive salary electronically, and also uh, savings facility and access to credit. Um, so that this what I've given you here is an example of how you might explore using a low cost school as a segmentation lens in your bank. It's not necessarily applicable and there are a multitude of ways we could go about it. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is actually defining how you're going to look at the market when you go into it. Um, if you go into digital and agency banking, you effectively have a number of risks and you have risk management to take care of. The, the biggest risks that you will be exposed to are legal risk as a result of having third party entities conducting banking transactions on your behalf brings legal risk. Operational risk, um, I know of a very high profile case in Africa where a mobile money operation was taken for about $3 million. I'm not sure by its own staff. I'm not sure how much of the money was, was recovered, but certainly all the staff were, were brought to book. Um, technological, you're talking about a lot of systems bolted together to do this, so there are technology risks. Um, compliance, again, you've got non-bank entities uh, acting on your behalf, which brings compliance risks. And reputational, when it all goes wrong, of course, it reflect, reflects on your reputation. The good news in all of this is that this has been done so often now that there are an, emer there are an emerging set of, of global best practices in terms of processes and systems. And quite frankly, if you pick those up and you get somebody to help you to put them in, you can never eliminate risk, but you certainly can mitigate most of it. All right, moving on to examples of the strategy types. And just a quick reminder of all the types. We've got expansion, cost containment, consumer services, and defensive. Expansion. In South Africa, a, uh, a, a non-banking financial institution or fintech, depending who, who's, uh, whose nomenclature you prefer, called Jumo, uh, launched about two, three years ago. Um, they go, they're, in, they're, they're already into version two of themselves, um, but in their, their version one implementation, they were a borrower, a non-bank financial institution who borrowed funds on the wholesale market and lent in the retail market. They were operating across Africa, um, out of Cape Town in South Africa. The credit rating is entirely alternate rating driven. It was entirely based upon how much prepaid airtime the client bought, his frequency of recharge, his frequency of call of, of you know, his frequency how, and, and how much. Um, and that enabled them to build a credit profile of him for small loans. Um, they, their go-to-market model is entirely behind the mobile money operators. So effectively, we're talking about a credit extender who has no current account relationship with the client. The money, the loans are disbursed via the mobile money account, which is an existing transactional account in the, in the customer's hands, and all payments of the loans are collected in, in, in exactly the same way. This effectively means that there are no costs, very there's very little cost involved in servicing these clients. Um, one of the initial go-to markets was in Tanzania in conjunction with Airtel. They signed up with Airtel to, gr to grant loans. Airtel insisted that they credit approve everybody for at least the first loan and only with only, only deny credit on, uh, for cases of proven uh, non-performance by the client. So they did something quite interesting because given their cost structure, they could actually grant very small loans to everybody. So in one night, they granted 3 million loans of 30 US cents across the board and disbursed the, and all of the, they offered it via an SMS. So if, so dear Mr. Customer, you've been credit approved for a 30 cent loan, which incidentally is enough for the cheapest prepaid at Airtel at the time. Um, if you'd like to learn, please say yes. Uh, most of the people who received that text said, said yes. 
The loan was a bullet loan of 45 days at 50% interest. Um, so effectively, the 15 days later, they were going to collect 45 cents out of the mobile money account. Of people who took the loan, 95% of the people paid it back. So therefore, the 5% was entirely funded, of course, by the margin on the, on the, on the 95. And very importantly, for 30 cents, you cannot buy data that will tell you a person will renege on a 30 cent loan. But Jumo is able to start, start um, profiling customers immediately. And for writing off 30 cent, a 30 cent loan, which is effectively what they did, they were able to work out who they would never do business with. And they've been ramping up loans with those customers before. The challenges that they've, that they've faced, they moved to a version two. I was never able to get from them exactly why, but my, my belief is that it's one of two things. It's either the ability to mobilize resources, which is a challenge that many MFIs face, the ability to get sufficient uh, wholesale credit to effectively onward lend. And the other one might be risk appetite because of, one will understand that the exposure builds relatively quickly if you're lending at those sorts of speeds. Version two, which is where they've migrated to now, is that they're a platform and they've moved themselves to a position where they will assist lenders to, to borrow sorry, to lend to customers via mobile money in much the way they were doing it. But their role is data is either data rater or uh, I've been watching them and in some, of their, in some of their implementations, they look like a data rater on behalf of a panel of lenders and the lenders basically operate in a supermarket where they compete with each other. The other, old, the other option is that, they seem, is that they might be building books and effectively selling those books or securitizing those books once built. Again, still based on, a, on alternate rating and still uh, linked to the mobile money operators. I see limits of growth in this model too. Uh, one will be if I were a lender and somebody came to me and said, I will rate a large base for you and give you credit ratings. My first question is, why don't you lend to the base? Because that's where the money is. And if you're not willing to put your balance sheet at risk, why would I put mine at risk? The other thing that I believe might limit their, their growth is that the sale to the mobile network operator is much more complicated because their sale to the mobile network operator is, please give me your customer data, then I will find somebody to lend to your customer base. It's a much more complex sale and therefore, and also not a clear cut value delivery to the, to the, to the telco. I believe that Jumo version one is a very strong FinTech challenger. And if Jumo themselves don't move back there, I'm reasonably sure you will see more entrants who look a lot like GMO version one enter the market and compete with you in the lending space. Customer service. Oops, sorry. Um, in Liberia, the teachers are in, in a specific area were, were all paid via a check. I did deal with this with this mod, with this um, example in my previous uh, presentation, so I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. Um, the challenge that of a, of a teacher in a rural setting receiving a check is that a check is not money and she cannot use it. So what they have to do is they have to travel to town and cash the check or bank it and then draw it by ATMs, etc. 75% of the teachers say that it cost them two days of teaching children or more to actually go and organize their money. And the others said it was somewhere between a day and a week. So because of this problem, um, MSTAR, who, who is a mobile network operator with a mobile money operation, together with, U, with USAID, ran a pilot and they invited uh, teachers to come in, 170 teachers to come and participate. They had an 89% buy-in rate, which for those of you who've run pilots will know that that's a very, very encouraging number. And it was driven by the systemic inefficiencies in the current payroll system. The results that they achieved, okay, just, just to underscore the, the, the inconvenience, 21% of teachers actually only take their salary every two months to avoid the inconvenience and the cost of going to fetch their salary. Think about what that means to their family cash flow. Um, but the other problem is it costs the teacher approximately 15% of her salary to receive a paycheck. And it takes 13 and a half hours of her time on average to do it. By going through mobile money and receiving their money electronically and cashing out at the local stores as agents, they were able to basically cut their costs to one twelfth of what they were from $25 to two. Um, and they saved themselves something like 13 hours. 
defensive strategies. Um, so I'm being hounded here, but on time. Um, monetize. A defensive strategy, by definition, is a low-cost delivery. It, it, what you will see, the characteristics of, of a defensive strategy are where a bank will turn around to their clients and say, we have one of these. Uh, won't, you, know, you don't need to move. The example that I, that I put forward for, um, for, for defensive and, and that is, is Monetize. Monetize is a payment services provider owned by all the big banks in, uh, in, in England and, and in Europe. And basically, it provided a generic mobile money offering to banks running on top of the bank's current accounts. You'll see on the list of clients over there that HSBC is one. I am an HSBC client. HSBC, um, I'm allegedly one of HSBC's favorite clients. They have never offered me their mobile banking. I'm reasonably certain that if I walked into my branch and said I'm leaving and I'm going to join Atom, who's a recent startup, purely mobile bank, because I want to be a mobile bank, they would give me the monetized offering. But they haven't sold it to me. Why? Because they do not see it as a market differentiator. They see it as a defensive strategy. If they're going to lose me as a customer, they will give it to me. But if they're not going to lose me, well, they don't really care. An interesting thing was in September, Monetize was sold from its existing shareholders who were all, the, all those banks who are clients used to own it. They've sold it to Fiserv in September. If you look at them in the bottom right-hand corner, that's Fiserv's share, share price vis-a-vis -vis the, the, their market competitors. And you will see that in September of this year, when they bought Monetize, the share price tanked relative to their, their opposition. It's because defensive plays are not are innately not, not big money spinners. They are defensive in their nature. And uh, in my view, it reflects the market's thought on defensive plays. Right. So what happens if it all goes wrong? I'm very, running quite late. I've got 15 minutes, apparently. Um, in my, my previous incarnation, very soon, very shortly after I joined a very large organization, a client that they had who had just received a very large grant to expand their operation out of being only metro, uh, metropolitan into rural, uh, about a week after the cashing of the last grant check, something arrived in a, a, a newspaper article was published saying that this entity had ceased trading and that all clients who have money in their mobile money wallets with this entity should go to their bank and they should collect their money because it is no longer trading. So I was asked to go and conduct a quick, share, quick have a quick look at what, is, what had actually happened, which I did, and I will share the, the learnings with you now. I'm not going to name them. I'm not going to name the country. Um, but effectively, what we had was study co. The, the, the purpose of this study, the, this, the com company that we're going to study, had an initial value proposition that they were going to be the single common play for the country. So they would service all of the banks and all of the telcos to all service their own customers across a common platform, i.e. it's an economy of scale play that they were going to do. Their value proposition was facilitation of access to banks customers on behalf of the banks across all telcos. When you play a central role in a market like this, and you, you've got competitors running on your platform, trust between everybody is 100% key because you need, bank A needs to be absolutely convinced that the clients aren't going to be sold, resold to bank B and so on and so forth. Uh, the telcos need to be convinced that nothing will be done on their network that will prejudice their, their market positioning. What StudyCo actually owned was a wallet management system, i.e. a transaction account management system, the ability to display those accounts on the phone and to transact over those accounts on the phone, and they had a small agent network that they were going to expand. Oh, sorry, one key thing. To do this, to play the central role, you have to have a contract with every other player in the market, those deal required errors. If you are not appointed by a bank to act on their behalf, you cannot act on their behalf. Similarly, if you do not have an arrangement with a telco whereby you can run your app on their network and use things like USSD and use things like uh, structured SMSs, you can't trade. Certainly they couldn't. This is pre-smartphone. 
Problem is that the day they launched, they only had a test agreement in place with one of the telcos and they had an agency agreement with one of the banks. This, the effect of that created business problems for them. First of all, because they, there were a lot of customers that they could not reach because they didn't have all the banks, their P2P payments and their remittance offering became ineffectual because there simply were not enough clients to, um, to, 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 to interact with each other. This meant that their revenue was well below expectation, but their costs were in line with their business plan. Part of the value proposition that they were going to that they were going to do is they were going to aggregate all of the clients in the country and open up electronic payments in retail. This is a country where car, where there were no, were very few cards in circulation, so this effectively would have leapfrogged the card industry. But the problem is that because there were no consumers, the merchants weren't willing to come to the party because there were no clients. And because they were because the merchants didn't come to to the table, the the entity could not draw more clients onto the platform. The telco and the bank, because they saw this as a looming challenge, didn't want to market it. Part of the deal was that the, the, the telcos and the banks were going to market the service to their respective customer bases. But because it started to look too small, they weren't willing to risk their own brand. So the solution that was derived within uh, this company that, that, that was under review was they will go alone and they will actually start building their own customer base. The problem with that is that the key issue in this whole thing is trust. And they destroyed the trust of the banks in the rest of the market. Because they moved from being a facilitator of all the banks to effectively being a competitor of the bank. This destroyed the relationship with all of the banks who hadn't signed. The bank that had signed was now drawn into question because it wasn't sure that it wanted to have this level of competition against its own competitors and within its own industry. The other telcos were, because they were pushing one telco over the others, the two that hadn't already signed up simply said they would never do it. And the one that, that was signed up found itself in a, in a strange competitive relationship with its opposition and its relationships with the other banks were, were at risk. So what happened? The business never got more than 25,000 customers. Now, I remember the magic number of 150,000 transacting every month. You will start to get a sense of, how, of the shortfall of revenue. To try and ameliorate that, they started running promotions in shopping malls where they would effectively subsidize the goods bought by 20% um, to, to encourage use and exploration with, this, with their payment mechanism. A study company itself was paying the 20% discount to the retailer. So the retailer was still getting 100% of retail price, but Study Co. was carrying 20 and, and they were trying to buy market share effectively. The problem is that, that customers saw this coming and less than 10% of customers who took up the, the, the sales promotion used the transactive device for anything except the sales promotion purchase transaction. Net effect is the business lost more than $6 million in less than a year and went insolvent. To my knowledge, no DFS has launched in that country since then. I have heard rumors that some people are trying to get something going, but digital financial services within that country has got a very bad name because all of the clients who had money held in their wallets were told to go to the partner bank to go and make a withdrawal of their funds. It was inconvenient and it was also it created a very bad impression of what digital can do in an economy. So what are the lessons learned from all of this? I kind of put this into two categories of do and don't. First of all, it is key that you have a clear strategy and that you have and a, and a clear target market. In other words, if you want to, if we're launching a business here, you need to be focused and you need to understand who you're selling to and why they will shop from you. Which leads to my next point, which is do solve a real customer problem. Don't don't believe in the in the techni the, the, the technical arguments that say that people are looking for cool technology toys. They're not. They're looking for banking solutions that are that are delivered in a, in a nice easy way to use. So solve real customer needs. Build and test very thoroughly. I've seen entities la launch with technical problems. And when you launch into a new market, you've got enough sales and, and marketing challenges on your hands 
the technology and the business processes need to be rock solid before you're selling hard. Pilot and take the results seriously. Many, many implementation build phases run over time in terms of money, uh, run over project plan in terms of money and time. And the temptation then is to just skip the pilot phase. Or when the pilot phase throws up an error, kid yourself into believing that the error doesn't really exist and launch anyway so that you don't have the rework of error fixing. Fatal mistakes, many businesses have, have got themselves into trouble by doing that. Be willing to partner and make sure everybody wins in the long term. Given that it takes something like four years for these businesses to break even, you can't, if you're ever doing a deal where you get the sense that you're scoring over your opposition, then you're actually not scoring, you're actually hurting yourself in the long term because within four years, the other guys will work out that this was not a great deal for them and they will stop supporting you, which will damage your business. Be open to buying people up. Be open to buying up, to buy, merge, cooperate with your competitors and with local fintechs. I've been in markets where there are fintechs who actually have very solid um, products and very solid distribution networks works but none of the banks will buy them it is the easiest way in if the guys have already built the business and it's already working it is sometimes cheaper to simply buy them and and link them to yourself rather than start again and try and compete with them in the market and push and try and push them out of the market don't chop and change strategies that's what the that's what uh, study code did they chopped and changed strategies without thinking it through there exists, the, the initial strategy was a very difficult strategy to execute. It's not easy to get everybody to play together. Um, but the day you decide that you're not going to support and you're going to compete, that is a massive shift in strategy. And you've got to back it up with a massive change in your go-to-market model and a massive change in your expectation of how much money you're going to spend to get into the market. Don't be unambitious. In other words, be very ambitious. Economies of scale are key in this business. It's a mass production type of banking. You're, in normal retail banking, you build a branch, you incur relative, well, high but controllable levels of cost. You fill that branch, then you, then you move to another branch and you build and fill that branch and so on. So your costs scale with your, with your revenue. In digital, you have a very big upfront capital hit and then you get your, your marginal cost per customer is low. But if you don't get economies of scale, the parrying cost of the capital becomes a very significant challenge to your business. Don't believe that customers will come just because it's funky. There's a lot of people out there who has UX, user experience has become a, a big issue that people speak about. User, user experience may kill a good project. In other words, if you have a useful product out there, but it's very hard to use, you may lose customers as a result. If you have a product which is at best neutral in the customer's life and maybe even doesn't really serve a need at all, but it is the most beautiful and the most brilliantly presented product in the world, you still won't sell. User interface and funkiness and all of that is important as a, as a hygiene factor, but it is not a determinant of the success or failure of your business. Don't view this as a technology project. I, I, whenever I'm engaged by the finance, by the by the IT division of a of an entity, the first thing I try to do is to move the project out of IT into um, into the business. For the simple reason, I'll give you I'll give you a ratio of the five million dollars peak funding that you will incur on a project. One million ish will be spent on IT. So if you look at it in commercial terms. It is twenty. It is twenty five. Twenty to twenty five percent of the of the of the financial exposure. In terms of brand exposure, it is nothing. This what we're talking about here is a whole different way of of conducting banking. It's not just about technology. It's about a new way of banking. So this should not be viewed inside the bank as a technology project. It is in fact a new business project and needs to be viewed as that. Don't scrimp on resources in your project. If it, it, this, ties, this ties back to the build and test thoroughly. Get, get people in who can help you, who can actually walk this road before, who can guide you. There are many pitfalls who can steer you correctly. Don't buy the cheapest platform because it won't, won't necessarily support you. Um, you know, in short, don't scrimp on the resources in, in your project. And very importantly, and it relates back to, to, um, to, to, to study co, don't forget who you are and who you need. 
in the case of Study Co, what they were was a technology company which with great ambition and a great, a, a, actually a great product. But their product was not a self-standing product. It required the willingness of others to participate. And that that's where they got it wrong. They they ignored the value contribution of other people. They forgot who they needed and who they actually were. And in so doing, they damaged their business irreparably. Right. Having said all of that, and now that you've got a sense of what's involved, my question to you is, is digital for you? And uh, I'll kiss. I'll Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> uh, we have the last poll before we start the Q&A session. So is digital something you are considering as an institution? So please select any of the replies. So we have three yeses, but with some like assistance and already doing it by yourself. And also a no reply, which is not your priority for the moment. So we look forward having you answer this question so we get a better understanding of our attendees and where they are with their digital financial services. And then we, as soon as we get the results of this poll, we will start our Q&A session. And we already have gotten a lot of questions. So um, keep sending us your questions. We'll try with Andrew to tackle all of them. Um, maybe we should close the poll for now and see the answers. Okay, we have a good 42%. Yes, we are interested and we would like some assistance and a good 33%. We are already doing it, but would like help to improve. So Andrew, if you have anything to say about this result and then we can take it forward. That's it sounds that sounds fantastic. Um, basically, yeah, um, it, it, there are a lot there are a lot of people out there who are, are in exactly where you are. This is a it's a powerful tool. It it but you need to with all as with all the other powerful things, you need to get it right. Um, the only thing I can say to you is we stand ready. We, we that's why Capitalist is here. We can help you uh, as and when you as and when you need help. Um, Alkis and and Ellen are ready to speak to anybody, I'm sure, at any time about their needs and we can take it from there if you need help. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for uh, keeping on track today. So we have <laughs> <laughs> so we have some more time to tackle the questions since uh, last webinar, the first part of this webinar. We didn't have a lot, but we replied to everyone. So I'll start immediately with the questions that we received. So the first one, what if the customer base is not used to digital services, especially where financial services are concerned? What shall we do in this case? Okay, your biggest challenge there is, is, is literacy training. Um, you would have, to, uh, well, first of all, we need to understand clearly why you want to go into digital in a country or an area where your customers are non-digitized. Is it cost containment or is it customer care that you're driving? What is it that you're actually looking for? Um, but certainly your launch, your launch campaign and your, and your whole go-to-market strategy is going to have to have a very strong literacy component and a very strong training component. Again, if you get your user interface right, your user experience right, you can lighten the load on the training. Um, but I definitely, yeah, you will have to do a lot of a lot of customer training to, excuse me, to develop their, their trust and faith in it. And also quite simply boring stuff of how do I do this and how do I do that? Call centers play a big role in that. Uh, you'd need to have a very, very well-developed call center who can actually walk customers through problems they're having. Okay, great. Thanks, Andrew. So we I'm going to continue with another one. So one of the participants is saying, I agree that one should not chop and change their strategy, but for how long do you stick with it before a redesign is necessary? One has to learn from mistakes quickly. Absolutely. No, uh, don't, get, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you can't change. For, this whole industry runs on what I call rapid failure. So yes, if if you got it wrong, doesn't mean you stick with it and, and, and fall and fall on your sword. If we got it wrong, we've got to fix it as quickly as possible and stop stop the losses. My point is when you if you have to do that, you need to actually think through the full impact. So study code that I dealt with there, 
went from their customers actually were the banks. Their switch in strategy turned their current customers into their new competitors. But they didn't actually take that on board at, a, at, a, at a, an intellectual level because the second you do that, suddenly you've got to understand that first of all, they're going to attack you. So they, they, will, they will sell against you. And they're also going to bad mouth you in the market, which they did. Okay, there, there was suddenly expressions of lack of trust in these wallets and who knows, maybe that entity isn't as strong as it is. When you're set, trying to sell a banking product in that sort of an environment, it's difficult. If they had internalized all of the chains that they were actually talking about, they would have had to approach this in a very different way, in my opinion, um, including a massive market education program of why it is that the small bank that is that, that was their, their uh, that granted them the agency agreement, in fact, is a very good bank for you. And there would be a whole lot more work that needed to go into it. But they, they retained focus almost exclusively on this is such a cool transactional product. But that was not actually their biggest challenge in the market once they had declared war on the bank. Okay, so in summary, yes, change, but understand that when you change, the, it, you have to rethink your whole structure top down. You can't just tweak and twiddle if you're going to do root and branch strategy change. Yes, to change one process here or there, you can do it on the fly. But if you get involved in a complete strategy shift, which 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 uh, the study co did, you're going to have to think really hard right from the top down. Okay, great. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we have another one also asking, so how do you restore confidence in the market after a six million loss? <laughs> With great difficulty, as my last slide said. Um, but basically, effectively, that market will probably be one of the last markets that goes digital for, the, for that simple reason, because the trust, the, the banking sector itself got hurt. They got hurt because suddenly out of nowhere, they got a, comp a competitor who they thought was their friend. So they will be very leery to undertake any sort of arrangement with anybody where they share their customer base again. Many customers got hurt and it got into the press. So the customers are going to be very cautious. They will probably only bank with banks. So in my opinion, that country will only go digital if the banks themselves do standalone operations. And the problem that, that they're going to have to encounter, deal with there in that specific country is that it's a relatively small country. So there aren't that many people living in it. Um, so, yeah, it, the, the trick, of course, is, the golden answer is please don't do those type of things. But once it's happened in your market, you're going to have to focus on rebuilding trust in the, in the market participants and in the consumer segment. And that's going to cost time and it's going to cost money. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we have received a question about how many more parts there are in this series of topics of DFS. And I just want to tell anyone that we're looking into the new year and new topics for new year. So we would love to continue on this series. So based on your feedback, we will decide. But also, please let us know what topics would you like us to explore um, for the new year and also related to DFS and we'll make sure to incorporate them in our New Year webinars. Uh, so now I'll get to the other question that we have received. So how feasible is a DFS in a small country with poor infrastructure, internet and electricity, even mobile penetration is I? Okay. So I just want to understand, see if I understand this correctly. You're saying Electricity reticulation, i.e. the ability to charge phones is bad, but the, the penetration of mobile phones is high. This is high. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. And so just run me through all the other constraints. There were some pretty tough constraints in that list. Just could take, run me through them again. Oh, just the internet and electricity. So poor infrastructure, okay. taking into yes. consideration internet and electricity, uh, small country, mm. and with a high mobile penetration. Okay. First of all, uh, uh, I know I know you can't clarify this, but if you if if you mean by a poor internet, you mean the fixed line infrastructure is bad, but the mobile infrastructure is good, leading to high levels of 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 mobile penetration. If the mobile internet is reliable, countries in that in that situation 
obviously you can run this whole thing on mobile internet the problem that with countries that are in this state is my experience is that they the, the mobile network operators tend to make the mobile internet very expensive um simply because they can um it's often about striking a deal that makes sense to the telcos for them to help you. You can't, of course, you can't save the, solve the electricity problem, but the fact that the customers are speaking on their phones and the fact that they're able to send text messages to one another means that customers have already found a way to charge their phones. The challenge we're going to have to solve is to get them to use data and or texts to, to bank. And it's going to be about managing the cost, the overall cost of ownership of the banking product for the client. And it's going to be about ensuring that we gain access to the network at as low a cost as possible, because it is possible for the telcos to press banking off the mobile phone if they so choose. Um, and, and I've seen a lot of countries where they've done that. Um, I, I personally feel it's a bit short-sighted, but some of the have, I, I have seen that in some countries. Um, so, a deal with the telcos might be a good idea. It also gives you access to their marketing and access to their customer base if we get the deal right. It just depends, of course, on the specifics of the country. Great. Thanks, Andrew. And if anyone, if the person that asked this question wants to clarify more, please, you can always write to us and we'll get Andrew to answer the question. A uh, very interesting question coming up. How relevant is the Agile framework in the whole digital initiative? Or rather, what is the best approach to manage and govern such a project? Okay, Agile, Agile is, is great. You need it because what you're talking about building here is a cross-functional project which sells across, basically, it's going to, I think it would be short, quicker to list the departments that are not impacted by a digital project than those that are. Pretty much, if, if you're a CEO of a bank, take the view that, that going digital is going to impact every single department of your bank. Agile for its ability to bring all of those departments together in problem solving mode, not problem creating mode, is fundamental to the project. Um, change management is a challenge especially in banks where there are a lot of there's a lot of vested interest in the existing distribution model um so i've seen banks where the where the branch management division in some in many respects is actually out to hinder digital because they see it as a threat so agile is great in that it draws everybody in um, you're going to have to change a lot of aspects of the business and you're going to have to change the project a lot within its own run. If we cast our minds back to, to one of the previous questions about not chopping and changing, you will chop and change. Um, reality does have a habit of biting. So you're going to need the ability to move to, to, to change the, the, the direction in the project and carry the bank with you as you go. So depending on your organization size, your, the bigger you are, the more you're going to need Agile. Let's put it that way. Thank you. So I'll take one more question since we have just two minutes. So is there any development on DFS to support Islamic microfinance sector given the size of the global market? Okay, D digital and digital, um, I would almost say is agnostic to the underlying assets. In other words, I the difference between lend between Islamic lending and non-Islamic lending is effectively how you manage profit rates versus interest. The technology management of that is fairly consistent across the two of them. Um, but the obviously the underlying assets and the way you view and manage and present the underlying assets is different. But I can't see that materially impacting a DFS project vis-a-vis, -vis, in other words, Islamic versus non-Islamic lending, I don't see as a major difference from a digital point of view. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And I just want to send a reminder to everyone to complete the post-webinar survey that you're going to receive in a couple of minutes in order to give your opinion on the 2018 webinars and any topics of your interest. We have received many other questions and we will be answering them, all of them shortly. And please go to our uh, LinkedIn profile and we'll also have a discussion there. So again, thank you to everyone for being with us today. Thank you to 
Andrew for this amazing two webinars that we had recently. And we look forward to having you in 2018.